So, tipping point. How little things can make a big difference. Malcolm Gladwell. The role of the pew. 11. What happens when two people talk? This is really the basic question here because that's the basic context in which all conversation takes place. You know that people talk back and forth. They listen, they interrupt, they move their hands. In the case of my meeting with Tom Go, we were sitting in a modest size office. I was in a chair pulled up in front of my desk. I had my legs crossed and a pad and a pen on my lap. I was wearing a blue shirt and black pants and a black jacket. He was sitting behind the desk in a high-backed chair. He was wearing a pair of blue shirt pants and a crispy pressed white shirt and a red tie. Some of the time he leaned forward and planted his elbow in front of him. Other times he sat back in his chair and waved his hands in the air. Between us, on the blank surface of the desk, I placed my tape recorder. That's one you would have been, have been seen. If I show you a tape record, the tape of our meeting, if, but if you had taken the video tape and slowed it down until you were looking at our interaction of a slice of a fraction of a second, you would have been something quite different. You would have seen the two of us engaging in what can only to describe be described as an elaborate and precise dance. The point of this kind of uh, analysis of uh, what's called the study of cultural uh, micro-rhythm is a man named William Cotton. Cotton. In some of uh, his first most of famous research projects in the 1960s, he attempted to decode a four and half second segment of a film in which a woman says to a man and a child over dinner, you all should come around every night. You never have had a dinner time like this in months. Codon broke the film into individual frame, which is refreshing about uh, uh, 45th and a second, then he watched it, and watched it, as he described it. <coughs> to carefully study by organization of a sequence of this, the approach must be naturalistic and astrological. You just sit and look and look and look for thousands of hours until the water in the material begins, so begins to emerge. It's like uh, uh, sculpturing. Continued study reveals further water. <coughs> and I was looking at this film over and over again. I had an enormous view of the universe that communication takes place between people. Somehow this was the model. You send the message. Somebody sends the message back. The message goes here and there and everywhere. But something was funny about this. <coughs> Gordon spent a year and a half on the short segment of a film until finally, in his uh, peripheral vision, he saw what he had always sensed was there. The wife turning her head exactly at her husband's hand came up. From there, he picked up other micro movements. Other pattern that <clears throat> occurred over and over again. While he realized that, in addition to talking and listening, the three people around the table were also engaging in what he termed interactional uh, synchrony. 
Their composition had a rhythmic physical dimension. Each person would do within a space of one or two or three uh, <coughs> one uh, forty-five six of a second frame, move a shoulder or cheek or an eyebrow or hand, sustain the movement, stop it, change direction, and start again. And that's more. Uh, those movements work perfectly in time to each person's own work. Emphasizing and under, underlining and elaborating on the process of uh, articulation so that the uh, speaker was, in effect, dancing to his or her own speech. At the same time, the other people around the table were dancing along as well, moving their face and soldier and hands and body to the same rhythm. It's not that everyone was moving the same way, any more than people dancing to a song or dance the same way, which that the timing of a stop and start of each person's micro movement. The jump and shift, the body and face were perfectly in harmony. So we can't research has revealed that it isn't just gesture that is harmonized, but also conversational rhythm. When two people talk, their volume and pitch fall into balance. What linguists call speech rate, the number of speech sounds per second, equalize. So, that's what is known as uh, latency, the period of time the lapse between the moment one speaker stops talking and the moment that the other speaker begins. Two people may arrive at a conversation with a very different conversational pattern, but almost instantly they reach a common ground. We all do it, all the time. Baby as young as one or two, they all synchronize their head, elbows, shoulder, hip, and put movement with the speech patterns of an adult. Synchrony has even been found in the interaction of human and apes as part of the way we are hardwired. When Tom Go and I sat across from each other in his office, then we almost immediately fell into physical and conversational harmony. We were dancing even before the attempt to persuade me with my his word, and he had forged a bond with me, with his movement and his speech. So far many my encounter with him different, so much more compelling than the conversational encounters I have every day. It isn't that God was deliberately trying to harmonize himself with me, some book on salesmanship recommend that persuaders try to mirror the posture and talking style of their client in order to establish a rapport. But that's been shown not to work. It makes people more uncomfortable, not less. It's too obviously funny. What you are talking about is a kind of super reflex, a fundamental uh, physiological ability of which we are barely aware. And like all specialized human traits, some people have much more mastery of this reflex than others. Part of what it means to have a powerful of persuasive uh, personality then is then you have to draw others into your own rhythm and dedicate the terms of the interaction. In some study, students who have a high degree of synchrony with their teachers are happier, more insured, interested, and is going. What I felt it go was that I was being seduced, not in the sexual sense, of course, but in a global way that our conversation was being conducted on his term than mine. I felt I was becoming synchronized with him, 
skilled musician know this and good speakers, said Joseph k e p e l a r who teaches as a um, member School of Communication in the University of Pennsylvania. They know when the crowds are with them, literally in synchrony with them, in movement and noise and stillness in a moment of attention. It's a strange thing to admit because I didn't want to be drawn in. I was one guided against it, but the essence of a salesman is that, on some level, they cannot be resisted. Tom can build a level of trust and r e f e r t in 5 or 10 minutes. Then most people will take half an hour to do more in s e a r c h of go. There's another more specific dimension of this. When two people talk, they don't just fall into physical and oral harmony. They also begin engaging in what's called moral mimicry. If you show people a picture of the smiling face or a frowning face, they smile or frown back. Although perhaps only in muscular changes or p o l i t i n g that they can only be captured with the electronic sensor. If I hit my thumb with a hammer, most people watching will uh, grimace. They will mimic my emotional state. This is what is meant in the technical sense. by i m p e s s i v e We imitate each other's emotion as a way of expressing support and caring and even more basically as a way of communicating with each other. In the brilliant 1994 book Emotional Contagion, the psychologist Elaine Hartill and John c a p i f o r and the historian Richard l a p s o n go one step further. Mimicry, they argue, is also one of the means by which we impact each other with our emotion. In other words, if I smile, you see me and smile in response. Even a micro smile that takes no more than several milliseconds, it's not just you imitating or emphasizing with me. It may also be a way that I can pass on my happiness to you. Emotion is contagious. In a way, this is perfectly intuitive. All of us have had our spirit picked up by being around somebody in a good mood. If you think about this closely, though, it's quite a radical notion. We normally think of the expression on our face as the reflection of an inner state. I feel happy, so I smile. I feel sad, so I frown. Emotion goes inside out. Emotional contagion, though, suggests that the opposite is also true. If I can make you smile, I can make you happy. If I can make you prone, I can make you sad. Emotion, in this sense, goes outside in. If we think about emotion this way, as outside in, not inside out, it's possible to understand how some people can have an enormous amount of influence over others. Some of us, after all, are very good at expressing emotional and feeling, which means that you are far more emotionally contagious than the rest of us. Psychologists call these people senders. Senders have special personalities. They are also physiologically different. Scientists who have studied space, for example, report that there are huge differences among people in the location of facial muscle in their form and also surprisingly even in their prevalence. It's a situation not unlike in medicine, says k a s h i f o r There are carriers, people who are very expressive, and there are people who are especially susceptible. It's not the emotional contagion is a disease. But the mechanism is the same. 
호워드 피드맨, 어, 사이클로지스트 at University of California at Riverside has developed a body called of effective communication test to measure this ability to send more emotion to be contagious. The test is a self-administrate survey with certain questions relating to things like whether you can keep still when you hear good dance music, how loud you laugh is, whether you touch friends when you talk to them, how good you are uh, sending seductive galaxy, whether you like to be center of attention. The highest possible score on the test is 117 points, with the average score, according to Pitman, somewhere around 71. <laughs> What does it mean to be high score? The answer that Pitman conducted a fascinating experiment. He picked a few dozen people who had scored very high on the test above 90 and a few dozen and scored very low below 60 and asked them all to fill our questionnaire measuring how they felt at this instant. He then put all of the high scores in separate rooms and paired each of them with two low scores. They were told to sit in the room together for two minutes. They could look at each other but not talk. Then, once the session was over, they asked again to fill out a detailed questionnaire on how they were feeling. Pitman found that in just two minutes, without a word being spoken, a lower scores ended up picking up the mood of the high scores. In this uh, charismatic person started out depressed, the inexpressible person started out happy. At the end of the two minutes, the inexpressible person was depressed as well, but it didn't work the other way. Only the charismatic person could impact the other person in the room with his or her emotions. It is what Tom Go did to me. The thing that strikes me most about my encounter is him and his voice. He had a range of an opera singer. At the time, he would sound stuff. His favorite expression in the state is Kesumi. At times, he would draw lazily and easily. At, uh, at other time, he would chuckle as he spoke, making his words singing with laughter. In this of those uh, model, his uh, face would light up accordingly, moving easily and deftly from one side or from one state to another. There was no ambiguity in his presentation. Everything was written on his pace. I could not see my own pace, of course, but my guess is that it was a closer mirror of his. It's interesting in this context to think back on the experiment is the nodding and the headphones. There was an example of someone for said from the outside in of an external gesture affecting an internal decision. Was I nodding when Tom Go nodded? and shaking my head when Go shook his head. Later, I called Go up and asked him to take Howard pretty much Christmas test. As he went through the list question by question, he started chuckling. By question mm, two, I am terrible. I am terrible at pantomime as in game like uh, uh, charade. He was laughing out loud. I'm great at that. I always win at uh, charade. Out of a possible 117 points, he scored 116.